All right, hello everybody. Um, this week's lecture is going to be on conjunctivitis. Uh, it's sort of a broad topic with a lot of information to cover, and so we'll go ahead and jump right in. So to understand the con uh, conjunctivitis, you basically uh, need to understand the conjunctiva. Uh, as we should know, it's a thin translucent membrane that covers the ocular surface. Uh, it's made up of three main portions. The bulbar conjunctiva is that that part that actually covers the sclera. You have the palpebral conjunctiva that lines the inside of the eyelids. Uh, and then you have the fornix, which is sort of that junction between the two. So the histology of the conjunctiva is made up of, up of basically two different portions. You have the epithelium on the surface that's made up of non-stratified squamous epithelium uh, with some goblet cells mixed in. And then you have the substantia propria underneath. Now the substantia propria actually is broken up into two basic layers. Superficially you have the adenoid layer. Uh, this is the layer that contains the lymphatic tissue, uh, which will be important when we talk about the follicles or a follicular reaction that forms. Uh, deep to that you have a fibrous layer, which is connective tissue, uh, and this helps adhere to the tarsus and underlying tissue uh, by anchoring septae. And these anchoring septae actually help form the morphology called papillae, and we'll talk about that in a little while as well. Within the substantia propria, you have some normal cells that you can find. Uh, these would include fibroblasts, macrophages, mast cells, neutrophils, plasma cells, and lymphocytes. Uh, however, if you have basocils or eosinophils, these are abnormal states. This is a histologic slide of the conjunctiva. Uh, here you can see that the upper layer is the epithelium, again, um, stratified, non-keratinized epithelium. Uh, and then here you can also see that you have a couple of goblet cells mixed in. Underneath that you have the substantia propria. The vasculature of the conjunctiva is derived from the anterior ciliary circulation as well as palpebral arteries. Uh, these vessels tend to move with manipulation and they blanch with topical phenylephrine. That's in contrast to your scleral vessels which uh, do not move and do not blanch. And so this, uh, these techniques are ways you can help differentiate this from scleritis which can also have sort of a dramatic uh, injected pattern. So conjunctivitis, in its most basic terms, is an inflammation of the conjunctiva, which is characterized by a cellular infiltration, exudation, and vascular dilation of the conjunctiva. Uh, and there are two different ways you can classify it. One is actually based on its duration uh, and sort of onset and symptoms. The acute, conjunctivi uh, acute conjunctivitis um, basically is present for less than three weeks by definition and has, uh, like its name says, an acute onset. It's more of a rapid progression with more impressive symptoms. Chronic conjunctivitis is by definition present for more than three weeks and it has uh, milder symptoms with more irritation and, and less acute features. So you can classify it based on duration, uh, but you can also classify conjunctivitis based on its morphologic patterns. Um, so you can have a papillary pattern, a follicular reaction, a membranous or pseudomembranous conjunctivitis, cicatrizing, or granulomatous. And for this lecture's purposes, we will actually spend most of our time on papillary conjunctivitis and follicular conjunctivitis. Uh, this is sort of a basic flow sheet that uh, breaks down acute conjunctivitis uh, into its various morphologic forms. Um, you have a papillary conjunctivitis, a follicular conjunctivitis, and a membranous conjunctivitis. Uh, and then uh, from those three basic forms uh, it shows you a little bit about clinical features, uh, some diagnostic um, methods to ultimately lead you towards your diagnosis. You can see here that um, chronic conjunctivitis actually has 
a broader uh, differential diagnosis. Um, but again, it's just a flow sheet that helps you sort out, based on clinical features, what your ultimate diagnosis might be. So papillary conjunctivitis um, basically is characterized by papillae. Papillae are projections of hypertrophic epithelium, and they have a central fibrovascular core. Uh, it's basically a nonspecific sign of inflammation, and it's present where the conjuncti uh, conjunctiva is actually attached to the underlying tissue by anchoring, anchoring septae, uh, such as the upper and lower tarsus. Uh, and so on the left-hand picture there, uh, you can see that you sort of have this um, fine uh, papillary appearance to it. Uh, it's not a smooth surface, uh, especially in the light reflection there. You can see that, uh, uh, you can sort of see the, the typical appearance of a papillary pattern. Um, on the right-hand side is just a histologic picture of uh, papillae, you can see um, that they sort of have a flat top to them. And then between the papilla, you can see uh, a space where the anchoring septates have attached to the underlying tissue. Uh, all of these uh, cells do have an underlying um, fibrovascular core, which helps differentiate from follicles, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, papillary conjunctivitis uh, also has a different form called giant papillary conjunctivitis. These are characterized by a giant papillae, uh, by definition, are basically greater than one millimeter. Um, and they occur because of a breakdown of these anchoring septae. So when you have these septae uh, that break down, you have a tendency for your papillae to coalesce, uh, and they just basically form larger morphologic structures. So your basic differential diagnosis uh, between papillary conjunctivitis and giant papillary conjunctivitis is listed below, and we'll go through um, a lot of these topics. So the first basic uh, is acute papillary conjunctivitis. Uh, and I, I would suppose that the most um, severe form of acute conjunctivitis is your hyperacute conjunctivitis caused by your Neisseria species. Uh, and this is sort of a dramatic, rapidly progressive disease uh, that's characterized by uh, abundant purulent discharge. Often a preauricular no node will be enlarged. Uh, it can be both unilateral or bilateral, and you can have corneal perforation. Um, recall that your Neisseria species are one of the bacteria that can uh, penetrate an intact corneal epithelium. And so if you have a conjunctivitis with these organisms floating around, uh, it doesn't take much for these organisms to penetrate the cornea and cause a rapidly progressive corneal ulcer. Down on the bottom left picture there, you can see sort of this dramatic picture with discharge and lid edema. Uh, on the right, you can see that uh, this is a corneal ulceration. Uh, centrally, you can see that the cornea has perforated, and that's actually retina that's coming through the center. So to diagnose hyperacute conjunctivitis, uh, certainly you have a clinical suspicion, but you basically confirm with a gram stain in which you're looking for gram-negative intracellular dip diplococci, and then also you confirm that with your culture. Treatment of hyperacute conjunctivitis uh, basically uh, will depend on if there is corneal ulceration or if there is not corneal ulceration. If there is not, then you can just use a single one gram intramuscular injection of ceftriaxone. If you do have corneal ulceration, then that, <coughs> that actually requires hospitalization, uh, frequent saline lavage, uh, and this basically is Every 30 minutes or so, you're flushing out the eye to try and get rid of uh, the organisms, the inflammatory cells, and this is going to help prevent corneal perforation. You're going to use ceftriaxone as the preferred agent. Again, uh, you use this IV, and you're giving uh, a larger dose more frequently. Uh, and then, basically, you can give adjunct 
uh, adjunctive topical antibiotics um, just because this is a severe disease and you want to throw as much at it as possible to help prevent corneal perforation. Because there is um, sort of this large uh, concordance with chlamydial infections, you should consider treating for that as well. And then, of course, you uh, screen and treat any of the contacts. For, um, for gonorrhea, you basically screen their sexual contacts. Uh, if they have a um, meningitis, then you want, you'd want to screen those who have been in close contact with the patient. Um, ordinary bacterial conjunctivitis also causes an acute papillary reaction. Uh, like hyperacute conjunctivitis, it does have a mucopurulent discharge, but probably to a lesser degree in terms of the volume. Um, the patient may complain about eyelash crusting. Uh, the common organisms that will infect uh, the conjunctiva include Staph aureus, uh, Mophilus influenzae, and uh, Streptococcus species as well. You diagnose bacterial conjunctivitis based on your gram stain and cultures, as with hyperacute conjunctivitis. Uh, and then you basically treat with broad spectrum but topical antibiotics. So that's acute papillary conjunctivitis. We'll move on to chronic papillary conjunctivitis now. Uh, one of the conditions that you may encounter is called floppy eyelid syndrome, and it causes a chronic papillary reaction. Uh, it's basically characterized by this rubbery, redundant upper tarsal tissue, which everts with minimal pressure. And just during your routine exam, if you're having the patient look around and you have them look down, you lift up the eyelid, and it almost everts right away. Uh, that's highly characteristic of floppy eyelid syndrome. And patients may not really have impressive symptoms, but this is a good way to screen for this. Uh, it's typically found in... Uh, obese or overweight patients that typically sleep on their stomach. And um, it's thought that uh, while they're sleeping on their stomach, the eyelids come in contact with their pillow and their sheets evert and actually cause irritation. There's also a known association with obstructive sleep apnea. And so if you do pick up on this condition, uh, it's important to sort of inquire about symptoms such as daytime sleepiness, snoring at night, uh, and then that's your potential to intervene and refer your patient back to their primary care physician for a more thorough workup to include a sleep study. Uh, the etiology of the actual floppy eyelid syndrome in the tissue changes is unclear at this point. Some people think that it's an abnormality in the actual uh, orbicularis muscle. Uh, some people think that it's a primary connective tissue abnormality, but could it be a, uh, an abnormality in the collagen itself or the elastin? We're really not sure. Um, treatment with floppy eyelid syndrome can range from conservative measures such as simple top, topical lubrication such as an ointment at night. Um, they can wear a protective eye shield or tape their lids at night to help prevent eversion uh, at night. And then um, sort of a more permanent solution is horizontal lid tightening procedure to help um, sort of give structure to the eyelid and prevent it from everting. Another condition which is interesting is called superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, or we'll abbreviate it SLK. This is a non-infectious uh, condition that also causes a chronic papillary reaction. Uh, it's characterized by a velvety papillary hypertrophy of the superior uh, palpebral conjunctiva, but you also have hyperemia and uh, either rose bengal or lysamine green staining of the superior bulbar conjunctiva. You have a tendency to have a micropanus with punctate staining uh, of this uh, around the superior limbus. And then uh, thickening and keratinization of the superior limbal bulbar and palpebral conjunctiva. 50% of these patients may have superior uh, filaments present as well. And so the pathogenesis is thought to be 
mechanical trauma from the upper eyelid uh, rubbing against the superior bulbar conjunctiva. Um, talking about systemic uh, associations, there's actually an association with audio, autoimmune thyroid disease. And so if you see this condition, it's important to inquire about pre-existing thyroid disease. And if there is none, then you should consider the workup. Uh, pathology. Um, the conjunctiva will actually show nuclear pycnosis or snake nuclei, and that's sort of a buzzword for your, uh, for your tests. It usually does resolve spontaneously, um, but ways to shorten the course are uh, anti-inflammatory agents such as autologous serum drops or topical cyclosporin. Uh, you can use a large diameter bandage contact lens to help cover that area. Or you can have thermocauterization or resection of the involved superior bulbar conjunctiva. Toxic papillary conjunctivitis is another uh, condition to be aware of. And it's actually the most common reaction that you can have to topical medications. Usually takes about two weeks on a specific drop to develop. Uh, it's characterized by punctate staining, especially in the infranasal conjunctiva. And that's basically where these medications tend to pool. Uh, so you put the drop in, and then it will collect um, in their lower tier film, especially immediately near their lacrimal drainage sites. Clinically, you're going to have hyperemia of the conjunctiva. It'll be a nonspecific papillary reaction, and with a little bit of mucoid discharge as well. Not necessarily your mucopurulent discharge, as you would see in bacterial infection. Um, typically, these patients have no itching or other allergy symptoms, and you don't find eosinophils on scrapings. And this uh, sort of differentiates it from, say, an allergy to these medications. So it's really more of an irritation caused by the, the medications as opposed to an actual uh, allergy. Now, toxic papillary conjunctivitis has a broad differential. These are just some of the medications that can cause the condition. Uh, below is sort of a dramatic appearance that you can see. This is actually a patient that had been on uh, topical trifluoridine drops, and it causes this intense hyperemia. Uh, and if you were to look at uh, the papillary conjunct conjunctiva, you would see, uh, sorry, the palpebral conjunctiva, you would see a papillary reaction. So when you see this condition, and it's causing the patient excessive irritation, you can always stop the offending agent, uh, and the condition should resolve. One important, um, I guess, thing to note is don't just treat the patient's symptoms with ad additional drops. That's one common pitfall. Uh, the patient has irritation, uh, and then you try and add more drops to try and treat their symptoms, and that just contributes to the, uh, to the toxic nature of this, especially if there's a common preservative involved. Uh, if the medication is absolutely necessary to treat the patient, say for glaucoma, um, then you should try to use preservative-free formulations. This will help cut down on the uh, irritation and may help if, if the offending agent is actually the preservative within the drops. Uh, when you stop the offending agent and the patient maybe has a more severe form, such as a non-healing epithelial defect, then this is a case where uh, more um, advanced measures, more invasive measures such as a tarsorophy may help. And so now we'll talk about giant papillary conjunctivitis, which again is a form of chronic papillary conjunctivitis. Uh, below there you can see a picture of the typical upper lid appearance with these large cobblestone appearing papillae. You can see some mucoid discharge uh, trapped within the, in between the papillae as well. So one condition that causes this is vernal keratoconjunctivitis, or VKC. Uh, this is a seasonally recurrent bilateral conjunctivitis. Uh, the patients are typically young, and they usually have some history of atopy, uh, you know, asthma, eczema, everything that goes along with it. Um, boys are affected twice as often as girls, and again, going with our associations, there's a known association with keratoconus. And this is thought to be because of all the eye rubbing that is associated with the uh, allergic condition. Uh, 
And so vernal conjunctivitis actually has a few different variations. Uh, one called limbal vernal. Uh, you can see a picture there on the bottom left where they're characterized by Horner trantis dots. Uh, so it has sort of this gelatinous appearance at the limbus. And then centrally you can see in some of those uh, gelatinous areas there's a uh, raised uh, elevated white dot. And these dots are basically degenerated epithelial cells and eosinophils. You also have a palpebral vernal form, which you can see there on the bottom right. That has more of your typical giant papillae. Uh, and then along with the giant papillae, you actually have rubbing on the superior cornea, which can cause a shield ulcer or an epithelial defect in that area. It's typical to be the upper uh, portion of the cornea. And so vernal ker keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis can actually be pretty severe if left untreated. It can lead to things such as corneal vascularization and also stromal opacification and scarring, especially if there is this component of a shield ulcer that is chronically present. Treatment can range depending on the severity of the case. Uh, it can be mild. Uh, mild cases are treated with topical antihistamines, and that may be enough to control the patient's symptoms. Uh, if you have mild to moderate disease, then the patient may require topical mast cell stabilizers. And remember, since VKC is a seasonal uh, disease, you can sort of get a, a sense of when the patient's symptoms tend to start. And remember that mast cell stabilizers take a few weeks to actually work uh, once you start them. And so if you start them a few weeks before your patient's typical symptoms begin, then that may uh, help control their symptoms. If you have severe disease, uh, then you might need something uh, as drastic as topical corticosteroids. But remember, these patients are young, and uh, steroids can cause problems, such as cataract and high intraocular pressure. So it's wise just to sort of give them a pulse dose, uh, where you treat them very frequently for several days and then quickly back off. Uh, and this may be enough to control their symptoms, and then you can maintain them on uh, milder medications like your antihistamines or mast cell stabilizers. If you have a case that's refractory to topical corticosteroids, then topical cyclosporin actually may be necessary. Atopic conjunctivitis is uh, another chronic papillary conjunctivitis that is similar to VKC, um, but there are some important differences. One is that your patients are older, and so they're not children, they actually tend to be adults. In contrast to VKC, they have year-round symptoms, and it's not merely a seasonal problem. Uh, they tend to have smaller papillae, and they're more likely to develop more corneal problems, such as extensive corneal vascularization and opacification. You can have extensive conjunctival, conjunctival scarring, uh, which can produce symblepharon, and they also tend to develop uh, posterior and anterior subcapsular cataracts. Treatment uh, is very similar to VKC, but remember, this is year-long disease, and so uh, you'll probably be maintaining patients on the medication, uh, and refractory cases may actually need systemic immunosuppression. So, Giant papillary conjunctivitis is sort of broken down into the allergic diseases, uh, VKC and atopic disease. But you also have foreign body disease that actually can uh, form these giant papillae. Uh, the most common agents that you'll see are contact lenses, and these can be either soft or hard. Um, ocular prostheses, as well as exposed sutures that may be irritating the, the upper palpebral conjunctiva. Um, the etiology of this condition is thought to be a mechanical uh, disease. Okay, so atopic conjunctivitis is another condition, and it's similar to uh, vernal character conjunctivitis, but there are some important differences. Number one, the patients tend to be older. These are adults. Uh, they tend to have year-round symptoms in contrast to a seasonal disease. 
the papillae tend to be smaller, and they're more likely to develop extensive corneal vascularization and opacification. You can have conjunctival scarring, which can be severe and produce some blepharon, and the patients tend to uh, develop posterior and anterior subcapsular cataracts. Uh, treatment in atopic conjunctivitis tends to be similar to vernal keratoconjunctivitis. conjunctivitis. However, refractory cases actually may need uh, more extensive systemic therapy. Now, vernal and atopic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis are sort of one uh, form of giant papillary conjunctivitis. But then you have sort of this other category, which is foreign body GPC. And so this can be caused by foreign bodies, namely uh, contact lenses, either soft lenses or hard lenses, ocular prostheses, and exposed suture material. The pathogenesis of this condition is thought to be primarily mechanical, but there's also um, this possible hypersensitivity reaction to the material. Um, to prevent the uh, giant papillae from forming or to help this condition go away. Uh, if you're able to remove the offending agent, such as changing your contact lenses, uh, removing or cleaning the prosthesis, or removing a, an exposed suture, uh, that should be the primary consideration. You can try to refit contact lenses. Uh, you can switch to daily wear lenses. Uh, sometimes the cleaner can be to blame for this condition. And so if you're able to switch to a preservative free lens cleaner, uh, that would be preferred. And if none of these things works, you can actually use mast cell stabilizers or corticosteroids for the short term uh, in order to help this condition resolve. So we talked about papillary conjunctivitis. The other form is follicular conjunctivitis. And this is characterized by follicles, which are these yellowish, whitish, uh, discrete round elevations, um, usually found within the lower fornix of the conjunctiva. And it's produced by uh, a lymphocytic response. Remember that these follicles are formed within the superficial adenoid layer of the substantia propria. And the central portions are actually avascular. So in, in contrast to papillae that have the central fibrovascular core, you don't see a cent center vessel within these um, follicles. So this is just a picture of the lower fornix here, and you can see these discrete round lesions. Histologic features of follicles uh, are shown below. Basically, they're lymphoid germinal centers, and they have fibroblasts uh, in the center. Uh, so you can see here, this is your typical follicle with this peripheral rim of uh, these inflammatory cells and then fibroblasts centrally. Follicles actually can be normal in childhood, and so uh, if you just see this on a patient with a routine exam and no complaints, just keep that in mind, especially if they're young. There's, a, again, an extensive differential diagnosis for follicular conjunctivitis. Most of these conditions tend to be viral conditions, as you can see there below. But the one exception is uh, one bacterial condition, uh, which is inclusion conjunctivitis. So, uh, as with, um, I guess, as with, a papillary conjunctivitis, you can have both an acute and a chronic form of the disease. Uh, chronic papillary conjunctivitis, the differential can be chlamydial disease, uh, molluscum, muraxella Lyme, or toxic. So we'll talk about acute follicular conjunctivitis. Um, this is a condition where you typically have uh, acute watery discharge, and we're talking about adenoviral conjunctivitis. Um, they have an acute watery discharge, uh, foreign body sensation, uh, 
they can't have photophobia. Typically it's bilateral, although it may start in one eye a few days prior to affecting the other eye. And this is thought to be from self-inoculation uh, from one eye to the other. So their clinical features are variable. And that's because there are actually different forms of the disease. As with any other virus, there are different serotypes. And that basically determines what kind of symptoms you're going to have. One of the most dramatic forms of adenoviral conjunctivitis is actually EKC, epidemic keratic conjunctivitis, which is a highly, form of, highly contagious form of the disease where you tend to have preauricular node enlargement and tenderness. You can develop diffuse punctate erosions in the corneal epithelium. Uh, later on in the course of the disease, you can develop subepithelial infiltrates. This is not an infectious component of the, the disease, but thought to be more of an immune reaction to the viral particles. And then you can have uh, variable symptoms such as conjunctive contractile chemosis, uh, hemorrhage, which, which can are, are typically um, sort of smaller punctate hemorrhages. And then you can develop membranes or pseudomembranes. In EKC, the typical serotypes are 8, 19, 37, and subgroup D. Uh, remember these numbers. They are, tend to be testable. Um, but EKC tends to be more of the severe form of adenoviral conjunctivitis, and these patients are very uncomfortable. Another form is called pharyngeal fever, and this is characterized by a follicular conjunctivitis, pharyngitis, as well as fever. Uh, your serotypes tend to be type 3 and 7. Uh, these are your most common serotypes. However, many other serotypes can also cause this form. This is a picture of the subepithelial infiltrates typical of EKC. You can see that there are numerous um, sort of round white lesions throughout the cornea. And they're scattered diffusely throughout the cornea. On slip beam to the right here, you can see that they, ha they have this uh, subepithelial location. And so you can see that they are collections of white cells right underneath the epithelium. When it comes to treating adenoviral conjunctivitis, most often your treatment is supportive. And so this is cool compresses and artificial tears, which basically just helps the patient feel better. Uh, another important aspect to stress to your patients is hygiene. And so since it is highly contagious, you want to make sure that the patients are not spreading it to others. Uh, your patients are thought to be contagious if they are hyperemic and tearing. Remember, if your patient tends to work in schools or healthcare situations or uh, any other occupation where they might be spreading the disease to a lot of people, um, you should counsel them about taking some time off work uh, until they're no longer contagious. Topical steroids can be used for adenoviral conjunctivitis. Uh, however, it's important only to use them in more severe forms such as contractile membranes or you have these subepithelial infiltrates as topical steroids actually can prolong the viral shedding. And so, uh, although it may help the patient feel better, the patient will be contagious for longer, and it may be tough to get them off steroids. So only use them in select circumstances where they really need them. Um, herpes simplex is another virus that can cause a follicular conjunctivitis. Typically, you see this in your primary HSV infection. Um, so if you have a dermatitis or a blepharo uh, conjunctivitis, um, that's when the conjunctival reaction actually happens. And that's most typical if you have uh, your typical vesicular lesion present on the lid margin. Then you have access for the viral particles to actually end up on the conjunctiva and form the follicular reaction. Often you also see a coexistent vesicular stomatitis or dermatitis, as we talked about. Uh, they tend to have a watery discharge. Preauricular lymphadenopathy can be present. And then 50% of patients with a, a blepharoconjunctivitis can also develop corneal manifestations, such as your 
uh, punctate erosions in your dendrites. Uh, if you have an isolated blepharoconjunctivitis, that's actually self-limited, and so, uh, again, supportive measures to help the patient feel better. Uh, Newcastle disease is another viral form of uh, follicular conjunctivitis, and it's, it's very uncommon, but it's a very testable condition. Uh, it's important to keep in your differential diagnosis. Newcastle's disease is basically caused by an RNA virus, uh, typically found in birds, and it can actually spread through birds. Um, and it also spreads to humans. It causes an acute follicular conjunctivitis, which is why we care about it. So since it does occur in birds, it's important to take an occupational history and find anybody that may be handling poultry or vaccinating these birds against Newcastle's disease. Uh, and uh, that's when you would start to think about Newcastle's as an etiology for this. All right, we'll talk about chronic follicular conjunctivitis now. The first condition we'll talk about is trachoma. Um, it's actually caused by chlamydia trachomatis serotypes A through C. And it's uh, worldwide, it's a leading cause of preventable blindness, and that's why it's, it's important. Maybe not quite as common here. Um, but if you have a patient traveling from outside the U.S. or uh, from, uh, you know, a country where sanitation is not quite uh, up to standards, uh, you can have, um, you can commonly see this condition. Transmission of trachoma actually uh, can be from eye to eye. Okay, so the first condition we'll talk about is trachoma, and this is caused by chlamydia trachomatis, serotypes A through C. It's basically a leading cause of worldwide uh, preventable blindness, and so that's why we care about it. Uh, it's less common here in the U.S., but uh, it is um, more prevalent in other countries uh, where they may have sanitation issues. Uh, transmission is... Uh, variable. It can be from uh, one eye to the other. It can be actually from flies spreading the uh, spreading the chlamydia, uh, and also picked up on fomites. And so, to diagnose tr trachoma, you basically need uh, two of the following clinical features. You can either have follicles on the upper tarsal conjunctiva. You can have limbal follicles and their sequelae, which are called Herbert pits, which I'll show you. You can have tarsal conjunctival scarring, and that's called an Arlt line when it's linear. And you can have a su superior vascular panis. Uh, complications of trachoma uh, are basically what lead to blindness, uh, and that's a scarring that you can have causing aqueous tear deficiency tear drainage obstruction, trachiasis, and tropion, uh, or you can have corneal opacification. And so here we have a few pictures of the clinical characteristics that we just talked about. Um, in this picture, you can see these are uh, upper tarsal follicles. Here you can see this linear scarring of the upper, upper tarsal conjuncta. Uh, conjunctiva, uh, which is your ARLT line. Down here you can see these are bulbar uh, or limbal follicles. When these degenerate actually you have depressions which are called your Herbert pits. Uh, and then here you can see you have a sup superior fibrovascular panis. So if you have active disease, you want to treat with either topical and oral uh, tetracycline or erythromycin. Uh, this includes a topical ointment for at least two, two months, as well as an oral tetracycline for three weeks. And uh, tetracycline is your preferred agent. There are other alternatives in the case that your disease is resistant to tetracycline, but that tends to be pretty uncommon. Um, chlamydia trichomatis can actually cause another condition called inclusion conjunctivitis. Uh, 
And this is other serotypes, D through K. Remember that, that tends to be a testable point. Uh, it is sexually transmitted and often found in conjunction with a urethritis or cervicitis. Your clinical features are a follicular conjunctivitis, a uh, scant mucopurulent discharge, as well as preauricular lymphadenopathy. Uh, if you do have follicles present on the bulbar conjunctiva, this is more specific. Uh, another condition that can cause this is uh, medications. So if the patient is not on any of the typical medications and you do see bulbar follicles, uh, this is highly specific for inclusion conjunctivitis. You can also have a micropanus, which can be present superiorly. Treatment options for inclusion conjunctivitis can include azithromycin, one gram as a single dose, doxycycline, tetracycline, or erythromycin for seven days. Um, this condition will have spontaneous resolution, but often it takes a long time. It can be six to 18 months, uh, and it's important as with hyperacute conjunctivitis, you want to identify and treat their sexual contacts. Okay, so in the last Okay, occlusion, inclusion conjunctivitis is another condition that's caused by chlamydia, uh, and it's basically the serotypes D through K. Uh, remember these, um, trachoma being A through C, and inclusion conjunctivitis D through K, that tends to be an important testable point. Uh, it is sexually transmitted and often found in conjunction with a urethritis or cervicitis. Clinical features of inclusion conjunctivitis tend to be um, your follicular conjunctivitis, uh, mucopurulent discharge, and preauricular lymphadenopathy. You can have follicles on the bulbar conjunctiva um, these are basically found in two conditions, one being inclusion conjunctivitis, and they're also, they can be medication induced. And so if you have a patient that's not on your typical medications, uh, then think about inclusion conjunctivitis if you see follicles on the bulbar conjunctiva. You can also have a micropanus present superiorly. Treatment options for inclusion conjunctivitis can include azithromycin, one gram as a single dose, or you can use doxycycline, tetracycline, or erythromycin for seven days. You can have uh, spontaneous resolution of inclusion conjunctivitis, but this often takes a long time, and it can be as much as six to 18 months, and so it's important to tra tra uh, treat these patients. Uh, as with hyperacute conjunctivitis, you want to identify and treat any of their sexual contacts as well. Molluscum contagiosum is a condition that can cause a follicular conjunctivitis, and it's caused by a pox virus. Uh, it's characterized uh, basically by these smooth lesions, and you can see below here is a picture of these uh, smooth skin lesion, and they have an umbilicated center. And so that's a typical lesion. Uh, when they do occur on the lid margin, that's when you can have viral particles getting into the eye and causing your follicular conjunctivitis. Remember, if you have extensive lesions, uh, more so than your typical patient, uh, that should lead you to think about AIDS, especially if there's no history uh, that may help diagnose your patient. Um, the histopathology is pretty characteristic. It has a typical appearance here. Uh, and you can see this round lesion. And there's really not much else that looks like this picture. Um, maybe it can look a little bit like keratoacanthoma. Um, but you have eosinophilic intracytoplasmic inclusions, which you can see here. Uh, and those are your Henderson-Patterson corpuscles that should give away the diagnosis when you're looking at a path slide. To treat molluscum, you can either excise the lesions, uh, you can perform cryotherapy, you can incise the lesion, uh, or you can wait for them to spontaneously resolve. However, this can take months to years.
So um, you can also have a toxic follicular conjunctivitis, so medications can cause both a follicular or a papillary reaction. Uh, certain medications that uh, are typical for a follicular response are listed below. Um, I highlighted bromonidine. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the most typical, but in my experience, Okay, so medications uh, can cause a follicular response as well, and so we have a condition called toxic follicular conjunctivitis. Uh, remember we talked about earlier how medications can cause a papillary response. When you see a follicular response, these are some medications to think about. Uh, I highlighted bromonidine here. I'm not sure if this is actually the most common, but it has been probably the most common medication that I've seen cause this. Uh, and that may be just the prevalence of patients being on glaucoma medications. Uh, I won't really go in depth, but there is another morphologic form of conjunctivitis called membranous conjunctivitis. And we discussed that adenovirus can uh, form membranes or pseudomembranes. But there are other conditions as well. Uh, a membrane the difference between a membrane and a pseudomembrane is based on um, basically whether or not it bleeds when, when it's stripped. Um, and histologically, it's, it's basically the same, but whether or not it bleeds, um, I think, is based on the degree of inflammatory response. And so if you have a more robust response, um, your membrane is going to bleed when you strip it from the conjunctiva. Uh, this is a differential, um, and I listed, I, I highlighted a few of the more common uh, entities. Um, but just be aware of it, and uh, we won't really go much more in depth about this. You can also have a granulomatous conjunctivitis um, caused by things such as sarcoidosis, a foreign body, or paranoid oculoglandular syndrome. Again, just be aware of this as an alternative, and uh, I'm not going to go in depth about any of these conditions during this lecture. One condition that I did want to touch on briefly, just because it's a very unusual condition and uh, tends to be testable, is ligneous conjunctivitis. And it's sort of its own separate entity, but I suppose you can lump it in with a, a membranous or a pseudomembranous conjunctivitis. Uh, and it's characterized by these uh, firm woody lesions. And you can see a, a couple of different pictures there. The um, lesions are typically characterized as woody or fibrinous. Uh, and they consist of fibrin, fibrin-bound TPA, epithelial cells, and also some mixed inflammatory cells. It tends to be bilateral and can recur after excision. And the cause is thought to be a severe deficiency in type 1 plasminogen. Um, the treatment for this condition is unclear. If you excise the lesions, they do recur. Um, there have been reports of purified plasminogen, fresh frozen plasma, heparin, corticosteroids, or azathioprine. Um, as of now, there doesn't appear to be a superior treatment for this condition although it does tend to resolve spontaneously after months to years. Uh, again, just sort of an unusual condition. It's important to, to know about it uh, and remember uh, the cause, which is a severe deficiency in type 1 plasminogen. And so I just wanted to summarize the lecture with a few high yield points. Uh, these tend to be the more testable topics. Um, just know that the difference between a, an acute conjunctivitis as well as a chronic conjunctivitis is uh, three weeks. And so uh, if it's present less than three weeks and more severe symptoms, it's acute. Uh, if it's present for longer than three weeks, think chronic. And that really clinically also helps you with your differential diagnosis as well. Uh, know the histology of papillae versus follicles. Uh, I showed you slides of both of those.
Uh, one of the main important points is the presence of a central fibrovascular core in the papillae. Okay, so I just wanted to summarize some of the high yield points from this lecture. Uh, these tend to be more of the testable topics. First, make sure you know the, that the difference between an acute and chronic uh, conjunctivitis is three weeks. And so if you have uh, symptoms present for less than three weeks and it's more of a severe presentation, think about your acute conjunctivitis. And if it's present for longer than three weeks, certainly think about chronic conjunctivitis. And uh, that's important when you're trying to think about your differential diagnosis. Um, if the patient has been having patients, uh, symptoms for a certain time period, uh, then that can help you narrow down your differential. Uh, know the histology of papillae and follicles. I showed you slides of both of these. Uh, one of the most important points is the presence of the central fibrovascular core within papillae. Um, that tends to be a testable point. Um, note that serotypes uh, of adenoviral conjunctivitis, uh, we talked about certain serotypes that can be present both in EKC as, where, as well as uh, pharyngeoconjunctival fever. Those both tend to show up on tests. Know about your system, um, sorry, systemic associations, because that's where you can really help the patient uh, if you look at their eye and able, able to diagnose a systemic condition. So for SLK, work them up for thyroid disease. Uh, for floppy eyelid syndrome, look into obstructive sleep apnea. For VKC, it's not really a systemic association, but it's a testable association uh, with kerat keratoconus. Remember, if you have extensive molluscum lesions, think about HIV and AIDS. If you have a giant papillary conjunctivitis, uh, if they're children, think vernal. If they're atopic, think adults. Uh, and then also think about Newcastle's disease as well. For anybody with an acute follicular conjunctivitis, uh, with an unclear etiology, make sure you're taking the occupational history, uh, and you may actually discover this more than you would think. And here are my references. Thank you very much and uh